taking up too much time, I just wanted to introduce our guests um, and our, our special guests. Um, and, and the purpose of stories, of writing and telling them and reading them is to make us less alone, to connect us across borders, nationalities, ethnicities, in the shared search for history and home. The American Writers Museum is honored to welcome you all for this event, which brings together an extraordinary group of writers to consider what it means to become a refugee. Viet Thanh Nguyen is the Errol Arnold Chair of English and a Professor of English, American Studies and Ethnicity and Comparative Literature at the University of Southern California. His novel, The Sympathizer, won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2016. He's also the author of the books Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War, and Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America, and the short story collection, The Refugees. His awards include the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction from the American Library Association, the first novel prize from the Center for Fiction, a gold medal in first fiction from the California Book Awards, and the Asian Pacific American Literature Award from the Asian Pacific American Library Association. He's here tonight to talk about the new essay collection, The Displaced, Refugee Writers on Refugee Lives. To amplify the stories of the unheard in a global humanitarian crisis that has touched more than 22 million people. With him, our fellow award-winning writers, Kao Kalaya Yang and Vu Tran, reading from their contributed essays. I'm gonna turn it over to Viet now, who's gonna talk for a little bit, and eventually we'll get to a Q&A for those of you who have questions. Thanks all. Well, thank you, Chicago. Thank you for coming out tonight. I especially want to thank uh, Vu and Kalia for, being, for joining us tonight. And the format is that I'm going to talk for a few minutes about some of the issues around refugees and the books, and then you'll get a chance to hear uh, Vu and Kalia read from and talk about their essays and the particular issues that are important to them. But first things first this is what I always do at these events. <laughs> All right. All right. Can't help it, I'm Asian. <laughs> Besides being Asian, I'm also a refugee. And I feel kind of weird saying that sometimes because when you look at me, it's clear I've made the transition from refugee to bourgeoisie. Um, <laughs> from camps to clubs. In the last couple of years, I've been invited to some very expensive clubs that would never have included someone like me uh, before I won the Pulitzer Prize. And so I take that as an opportunity to go there and say things I shouldn't say. Um, try to say some of those things to you tonight. Uh, but you know, I, I think it's actually urgent um, for, for me to acknowledge myself as a refugee, even though technically I ceased being a refugee a long time ago. You know, there are official definitions of what a refugee is, and I no longer fit that definition. But I'll tell you a little bit about my, about my life story and why, why I still call myself a refugee. And that is that I was born in 1971 in Vietnam, and of course, that was in the middle of the Vietnam War. And in 1975, when Vietnam fell or was liberated, depending on your point of view, my parents ended up on the wrong side. Uh, and so they fled with 130,000 other Vietnamese refugees to the United States, and they were put in one, to, one of the four uh, refugee camps that were set up to handle uh, these refugees, and we ended up in Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania, and I was four years old. So in order to leave one of these refugee camps, you had to have a, an American sponsor. And the problem was that there wasn't one sponsor who was willing to take all four of us. So one sponsor took my parents, one sponsor took my 10-year-old brother, and one sponsor took four-year-old me. So now I'm the father of a four-year-old, and I can now see the world better through my parents' eyes and realize just how painful it must have been for them to have had their four-year-old child taken away from them. And of course, that's where my memories begin at four years old. I don't remember anything about Vietnam, but I remember the refugee camp and I remember being taken away from my parents and I remember howling and screaming because of that. So my memories begin there. My ability to tell stories begin there. And that's why somewhere in the back of my mind, I'm still a refugee. Um, but you know, it wasn't all bad. Uh, I got taken away for three months or so. My brother, who was 10, got taken away for two years. You know, and so he tells me, that's how we know mom and dad love you more. 
Don't feel too bad for him. He went to Harvard. <laughs> then just to rub it in, he went to Stanford, which is what you're supposed to be when you're Asian. Anything else is like the Asian F, otherwise known as the B+. Um, <laughs> and as for me, it wasn't all bad because being a refugee gave me the requisite emotional damage necessary to become a writer. And uh, <laughs> I've tried to pass that on to my son, uh, four years old. He's your typical four-year-old. He loves Legos, always wants more Legos. And of course, you can't give a four-year-old everything he wants. You have to deny him stuff sometimes. You gotta say no. So when I ask him, do you know why you're not gonna get these Legos? And he'll look at me and he'll say, because you're a refugee? <laughs> That's right. That's absolutely right. It's important, I think, for me to look at my son and, and, and realize that he's gonna grow up, regardless of anything I do, sort of a, this American middle-class person. And I want to teach him something about who his parents and his grandparents are. We're all refugees from Vietnam. And I want to teach him something about empathy, about knowing what a refugee is and needing to empathize with them. Because it's very easy, number one, not to empathize with refugees. And number two, it's very easy not even to identify as a refugee when you're a refugee. So for example, I, I was, uh, I gave, I've done a couple of talks to high school students in the last couple of days in Seattle and Portland. And in one of those classes, the, the teachers told me in advance, there are refugee students here. So I asked them, how many of you are refugees? None of them raised their hands. But I asked them, how many of you are immigrants? And some of them raised their hands. Now what's going on? Do they not understand the distinction between immigrants and refugees? Or is it that they actually understand what that is and don't want to call themselves refugees? Because I asked another class, what do you think of when you think of refugees? And they said, well, we think of boats and death and starvation and refugee camps. So of course, maybe there's a disincentive to acknowledge yourself as a refugee, which is why it's so important for me to claim an identity as a refugee, right? Because there are so many people who want to disavow this and disavow the necessity for empathy with refugees, beginning with some of my Vietnamese brothers and sisters. I mean, for example, there are some former Vietnamese refugees or Vietnamese former refugees out there who are saying, we were the good refugees. But these people today, Syrians, for example, those are the bad refugees. Let me tell you something. I grew up in a Vietnamese refugee community in the 1970s and 1980s in San Jose, California, and there were a lot of bad Vietnamese refugees. <laughs> Welfare scams, insurance fraud, cash under the table economies, and we invented the home invasion. That was a phenomenon of Vietnamese gangsters invading Vietnamese homes that was so prevalent the San Jose Police Department had to come up with that term just to describe what they were doing. Okay. So there were a lot of bad Vietnamese refugees, except now we've forgotten about them, and we'd rather remember people like my brother, Harvard, Stanford, doctor, He's, and we've forgotten that in 1975, the majority of Americans actually did not want to accept Vietnamese refugees or Cambodian refugees or Laotian refugees. And I had a very personal reminder of that. 1978, my parents moved from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to San Jose, California and opened perhaps the second Vietnamese grocery store in San Jose. And I remember at 10 or 11 years old, walking down the street from my parents' store and seeing a sign in a store window that said, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese. And I didn't quite know how to make sense out of that sign, but I knew it was obviously directed against people like my parents. And I thought, does the person who wrote this sign know that my parents work 12 to 14 hour days every day of the year in this grocery store, except Christmas, Easter, and New Year's? Does this person know that my parents were shot in their store on Christmas Eve? Does this person know what my parents have been through in order to get to this country and to become the people that they are? And clearly, this person did not know that. This person could not empathize. This person did not see my parents as human beings. 
This person saw them as Vietnamese, as refugees, as threats. And then I went to a primarily white high school in San Jose, and there were a handful of us who were of Asian descent, and we knew we were different. And so every day, we would gather in a corner of the campus, and we would call ourselves the Asian Invasion. <laughs> so we, you know, the only language we had available for ourselves was the same racist language that was being used against my parents. And at that time, I didn't know what I was missing. I didn't know that what I needed were voices like Vu Tran, Vu Jun, Vu Tran, to Americanize it, Vu Tran, Vu Jun, Kao Kalia Yang. I needed these voices of refugee writers and Asian American writers. And of course they existed, but I didn't know where to find them. I didn't know who they were. And I guess we can look back on this past of the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and this paucity of refugee voices and Asian American voices, and we can say that it was partly due to structural racism, but honestly, it's mostly due to Asian parents. <laughs> Asian parents, you gotta do better. Don't crush the dreams of your children who wanna be artists. Encourage them, nurture them, so that they too will one day grow up and write scathing autobiographies featuring you. <laughs> no, really. Uh, they'll grow up exactly be like our two authors here tonight. Um, I'm so honored to be with them. Uh, they've done incredible work. And I just want to tell you a little bit about them and give them some time to talk about their contributions to this anthology. And then after that, I'll tell you a little bit more about the anthology. Cal Kalia Yang. Hmong American author, but also just author of The Late Homecomer, a Hmong family memoir from 2008. It was a winner of the Minnesota Book Award and a finalist for the Penn USA Award in Creative Nonfiction and an Asian American Literary Award. She's also the author of the more recent The Song Poet from 2016, which was another winner of the Minnesota Book Award and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, Penn USA Award, and a Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Her forthcoming book is A Map of the World, a children's book coming out next year, I believe, and along with six or seven other books. So you're going to be um, like J.K. Rowling, I hope. Uh, <laughs> all right. And uh, over there is Vu Chan, or Vu Tran, uh, who's a novelist. His first novel was entitled Dragonfish. It was a noir novel that was really a, a great read, as were both of um, Cal Kalia Liang's books. Um, uh, and the uh, novel Dragonfish was a New York Times notable book. He is writing a novel right now entitled Intruders in Smoke. His short stories, and he wrote a lot of short stories, and I knew that because I had been reading his short stories well before he uh, became a published novelist. His short stories have been published in many places, but most notably perhaps anthologized in the O. Henry Prize Anthology and Best American Mystery Stories. He has an MFA in creative writing from, the, from Iowa, uh, PhD uh, from the University of Nevada at Las Vegas, and he's an assistant professor of the practice of, of practice in the arts and director of undergraduate studies in creative writing at the University of Chicago. Thank you. I'm not going to jump down because they won't be able to get up. <laughs> there are these very real disadvantages that I face. Um, but before I do the reading, I'll tell you a little bit about me because I reckon none of you know my work. Anybody? Oh. Uh, like three people. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, so like Viet said, a Hmong. And before I start, I want to say thank you. As charming as Viet is, as fashionable, he's got this great big heart that remembers so many of us along this journey. And so Viet, thank you for creating space for a new audience for me. Um, I'm a Minnesota author. I think I come from a li very literary state. Um, but it's also a very white state. It's a state where uh, we have more refugees per capita than any other state in the nation, but it's like 79% white. Um, we have the biggest Hmong population, and I'm a part of that population. My story begins long before America, though. It began in December of 1980 when I was born. I opened my eyes to about 400 acres, Ban Binai refugee camp. The Hmong had sided with the Americans in America's secret war in Laos. When the Americans, in the war, a third of the Hmong had died. 
After the Americans left, there was a declaration of genocide against my people. Gao San Patat Lao, the leading communist paper published, it is necessary to extirpate down to the root of the Hmong minority. So my family, like thousands of others, were waiting for peace when these big trucks came and they took the men and the boys. And the women and the girls waited and the days passed and they, go, they start looking and they found their bodies rotting on the jungle floor um, like fallen fruits. That's the story that I come from. But I was born on the other side of the river. I was born in a time mom and mom, when mom and dad said that they had nothing. They did not dare dream of presents. So when I was born, my grandma gave me a happy name, Go Galia Ya, the song of the dimple or the maiden, the maiden of the dimples. So everybody calls me dimples. I was born to embody some kind of happiness, some kind of joy, which is really incredible because, you know, another third of the Hmong died after the Americans left. So two thirds of my people were slaughtered in that war, the population in Laos. And, they give, and then these poor refugee parents gave birth to me and they, they gave me a name. They said to bring joy and to bring happiness to the world. They faced everything that the world could do in terms of death and destruction, and they dreamt of a future full of smiles and laughter for their child. So that's the place where I was born. I couldn't go to school. I was six by the time we left the camp, but it was overcrowded. 40,000 people on 400 acres. We got food three days a week couldn't go to school, and so from my earliest memories, I'd sit at the foot of my elders because suicide was the number one cause of death. All these people were killing themselves, and, and every time I hear the drum of the dead would beat, all the adults would cry, why are you dying here? Why are you dying in this place that does not want you? Get up, get up, so we can go home. Home was a place I'd never known. I used to ask, I asked my grandma, where's home? And she'd tell me a story of Laos. I asked my dad where home was, and he'd tell me some imagined future in America. But I had this father who was determined that I get to live by my name. And so he used to take me to the tops of the trees because we couldn't leave the 400 acres. Um, and he would tell me, may I one day your little feet will walk on the horizons your father has never seen. He'd hold my hands, and I have tiny hands, tiny, tiny hands. And he'd say, the size of your hand and your feet, these things will not determine your journey. You are not a child of poverty, of war, or despair your hope being born, the captain to a more beautiful future. And so I grew up with that kind of love around me. I think that is the only reason I can do the kind of work I do today. Because I was born in an ocean of love so deep that my feet have never touched the bottom, so vast that my hands have never touched the sides. And so, of course, when I was very young, I'd go to the library. Because we didn't have VCR, we didn't have much money. People knew that there were all these Hmong people, they didn't know what we were doing here. All along the streets of the, the sidewalks of my childhood, I can remember people saying, what are you people doing here? You're doing nothing but slowing us down. And then the laments, the regrets, the wishes, and the yearning to be understood that I could feel so poignantly from the adults around me. So shaped by stories, I became a writer. My first book came out 10 years ago, so I've been at this thing for 15 years. Um, so one of the questions that people have when you have a first generation uh, writer from a community like mine that most newspapers described as pre-literate, the most primitive population to enter the US, um, the question is, does she have another book? Does she have other stories to tell? That's a big question. Anne Vadiman, who's The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, the first and the most well-taught book about my people in the world. You know, when she met me the first time, she didn't talk for a long time. She just listened as her husband um, asked me questions and I tried, it. I tried to speak. And then she said, I was listening to see if you're a real writer or if you only had one story inside of you. And then she looked at me and she said, but you're as real as they come. So when Via asked me to write about refugees, I wanted to visit that place where I was born, that hungry place that taught me so much about love, so much about hope, so much about belonging. And what I decided to write about were the Yang warriors. I wasn't brave enough to be a warrior myself, but I, I, I was a witness. So my sister, my cousin, and all these little hungry boys and girls, they were this, they call themselves the warriors because we got, people never think about refugees as international, but we're incredibly international because all the religious traditions want to come and share the Bible and share their faith traditions. All the different um, countries 
they have NGOs and other organizations that come into the camp. So we grew up surrounded by the world and among the forces that we reckoned with were Hong Kong cinema. So I grew up watching these long, elaborate dramas. So they were the Yang Warriors, this group of children. And one day they went on a mission to get us food because we only got food three days a week. And this is from the end of my essay because I don't believe in ruining, I don't believe you can ruin the endings of things. Eventually we all die. Before then, we get to adventure. So this is from that adventure. For lunch, I ate fried morning glory that day. It was fried with garlic and seasoned with fish sauce. I ate it with broken rice on a white metal plate with peeling enamel. I had never liked greens, but I remember the crunch of the morning glory stalks and how the oil had seasoned my rice, made it slippery, slightly sweet from the garlic. I ate it with the other younger children from the compound at the long table. None of the members ate the morning glory meal with us. They chose not to on their own accord. They understood that it was their honor at stake. They looked over us as we cleared our plates and licked our spoons, hungrier than even we knew for the taste of wild greens. A hint of freedom from beyond the fence compound we knew as home. They had been mere children before the meal, playing a game I was not particularly interested in. But after that morning glory meal, they became the warriors of my childhood in Bon Vinai refugee camp. We'd all heard the stories of how our mothers and fathers and our grandmother went through a war in Laos to bring us to Thailand. I knew we were survivors. I had not imagined us as warriors. Long before we left that dry, dusty, hungry place, it was they who taught us how to venture beyond our captivity. I see them now from the far distance of time and space, a group of 10 children standing on their dirt lines beneath the bright sun. At their center was Master May, a pot-bellied boy who stood without a shirt, his skin glistening with sweat, his shorts falling well beyond his knees in the bright sunshine, spine straight, gazing not at the world around us but within himself. I see at the edge of the circle the two girls, the five-year-old frowning away her discomfort, growing taller than her years, and my older sister Dao, with her scar across her left temple, one of her legs slightly shorter than the other, braced against the earth. They're glorious in the sun of my youth, the warriors standing for all of us. They taught me how to fight, so I, I thought I'd share a little bit of that fight with you all today. Thank you. I loved Kalia's essay. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it clearly is a small part of a much bigger world and experience. And I kept thinking that I wanted to, to read the rest of it or to, to know the rest of it. Um, I, uh, my name is Vu. Uh, I first want to thank Vit too for inviting me to, um, to contribute an essay to this book. But, but also, you know, I, a lot of people know this, but I, I do want to, uh, to repeat how supportive Vit has been to, to so many different writers and, and, and so many different artists, um, especially with our background, uh, and how supportive he's been of me and my work uh, in so many different ways. So uh, I'm incredibly uh, uh, grateful for that. Um, and also to underline, to put, you know, flash the lights, to flesh out this conversation, um, about the refugee crisis uh, that has always been here, uh, always part of uh, America's history, uh, but particularly now uh, part of world history, I think uh, is, uh, again, we're, I'm very grateful for, for his work on that uh, front. Um, Vit and I have some, a, a lot of similarities, and then, and then we depart in, in a lot of ways. You know, I was born in 75, um, my father uh, fought for the, uh, the South Vietnamese Air Force and therefore with the Americans. So once Saigon uh, fell to the north, he had to leave. And so that was about five months before I was born. So he left and my mom wasn't sure what happened to him. We were supposed to leave with him. Um, I have a, a sister who's two years older. And we were supposed to leave with him, but then he had to leave without us. And we didn't know what happened to him. We didn't know, uh, my mom didn't know he, 
whether he had survived or not. Didn't know for about a year. But anyway, I spent my first five years uh, in Vietnam, raised by my mother and her family. And then we, you know, totally her on her own, you know, uh, it was all her doing. She bought, you know, passage for us, uh, my sister and I and her uh, on a small fishing boat. Uh, you know, it was like 90 people, but it was probably big enough. It should have had maybe big enough for like 20 people, but there were 90 people on there. And we spent six days at sea. We were headed towards Singapore. Captain got lost, so we ended up in Malaysia. Uh, but we were incredibly lucky, uh, incredibly lucky, uh, given how many people have died, how many people were traumatized and, and hurt along the way. Uh, my family and I were incredibly lucky. We ended up in Malaysia and spent four months uh, in Pilar Bedong, uh, which is one of the Pal uh, Palau Islands, in a, a refugee camp that the Malaysian government and the U.S. government um, joined forces to, um, to fund. And I think it's, do you know, that it stayed open until like 1989, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, my father sponsored us. He had settled in Oklahoma, of all places. He was sponsored uh, by a Catholic priest. I, I grew up Catholic. Uh, don't tell my mom that. I'm still, no. Um, but, uh, so I met my father there. Um, and I, I grew up, I spent 20 years in Tulsa. And, and this is where I think our experiences really depart. Because I would have never come up I would have, first of all, I didn't have any Asian friends to come up <laughs> with a group, uh, but I would have never called it the Asian invasion. It, it wasn't necessarily that I was ashamed of, of who I was, uh, but it's like, I mean, you're almost conditioned to kind of self-erase in many ways when you don't see anyone who looks like you, uh, especially at that age. And I, I grew up very much um, uh, conditioned to feel that way. To, to want to, I, I remember obsessing over my nose, uh, as a lot of Asians are, and wanting, when I get older, I'm gonna get a nose job, you know? Things like that. Um, and, uh, I mean, there's more I can say about that, but it, I want to mention that because, uh, you know, this whole I, question of, am I still a refugee? Um, it's almost a question of, of if am I willing to call myself a refugee? Um, and for a long time, it wasn't a question that I articulated to myself, but I think the, the answer to it, whether I knew it or not, was no. And honestly, it was Vit. This is only a f three years ago, reading Vit's interviews and his, his work, that I realized, why am I, I asked myself that question again. And, um, and I kind of started with that question in my essay, and I, I found myself uh, not sure, I wasn't quite sure, you know, how to define what a refugee is. Um, you know, the first thing I thought of was, you know, maybe some of you are familiar with Hannah Arendt's famous essay, We Refugees where she talked about how, you know, as a Jewish refugee, this is, I think, it's published in 43. Um, as a Jewish refugee, she said, we refugees, we, we don't want to think about the past, not only because it causes us pain, but because we don't want to reveal ourselves in that way to people. So we concentrate on the future. And in a sense, we are, and this is a quote from her, we, we are, you know, the avant-garde of, of, of our people. Um, the future, in a sense. Um, and that was the only kind of satisfying definition I can think of. Uh, all the other ones that I found dictionaries didn't quite work. So then I, I, I thought maybe the better question is to ask what is a refugee like? Uh, because this is my tool set as a writer. This, the, the, the tool set of artists is to, to deal in metaphor, in, in analogy, in comparison, because that's when it really feels uh, that's when things resonate the most, I think, when, when you deal in metaphor uh, uh, and comparisons. So, uh, you know, uh, basically what I offered in my essay was um, a taxonomy on, on refugees, um, you know, 
I compare refugees to orphans uh, in various ways. And I you know, compare refugees to uh, an actor. Um, and I also compare them to, uh, to ghosts. So I'll read this portion of, of the essay. For those who can never quite accept her, a refugee is like a ghost. To them, she's come from another world, an obscure and incomprehensible world, and now resides in the shadows of this one, an alien entity, an intruder. She can be invisible even though her presence is felt. If she is seen, she might very well be seen through, a specter both present and distant, both acknowledged and denied. She can be spoken of in whispers, but also caricatured in the stories that contain her. She can be feared even when she is not there, sometimes irrationally so, more significant and sinister than any version of herself that she could have conjured. And in that sense, she can be mythologized. She is seen as a man manifestation of the past and, a dark, and as a dark harbinger of the future. Though it can be argued that the anxiety she inspires is little more than a projection of the beholder's personal fears, deeply rooted in religious, political, and cultural beliefs that are themselves a mythos. That's all to say that a refugee's outsized effect on people, on those who cannot accept her, is motiva motivated more often than not by the imagination. What they feel, though, is not imaginary. It is real and consequential. If anything, it is imagined into being. And that space between what is real and imaginary is ultimately where the refugee resides. Like a ghost, her state of being to others and even to herself is ambiguous. Her identity, her goals and desires and intentions, her place in the world she now inhabits, they're all as hazy as those memories of the world she was once born into. We're going to have time for questions from the audience. That's always one of my favorite uh, things to do during these kinds of events. But there, we're also going to talk a little bit more about, about this anthology. And let me, uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, it actually wasn't my idea. The, the idea actually came from Jameson Stoltz, who's the editor of Abram Books. And uh, when the so-called Muslim band was enacted uh, many months ago, he realized that he was married to a refugee. That had never actually come up before. <laughs> uh, you know, like so many, of, so many other people, you know, they, she called herself an immigrant until the Muslim ban forced her to actually acknowledge to her own husband that she had in fact come as a refugee from the Soviet Union. And so Jameson realized that his children are the children of a refugee and became very, uh, he became very active against this Muslim ban. And so he came to me with the idea of doing an anthology of refugee writers on refugee lives. And now there's 17 other writers besides me who are involved in this, and I'll just let you know some of the countries that they came from. Uh, Afghanistan, the Soviet Union, Pakistan, Vietnam, Chile, um, Hungary, Mexico, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Bosnia, uh, Iran, uh, and Zimbabwe, uh, Laos, uh, Thailand, I'm not sure exactly where the or where we would pin the origins of the Stateless Mon. Stateless child. Uh -huh. um, so, so many, other, so many countries are, are included in this collection and it was, it was actually really important that we pick writers. Because if we just wanted to do interviews or oral histories, there'd be an endless supply, right? But it was important to come up with writers because we actually wanted writerly essays. And there's something about oral histories and interviews that are obviously very powerful because they draw from people's real life experiences. So for example, um, Alexandra Heyman, uh, who is from Bosnia, his, his story actually is actually an interview of another Bosnian refugee. And you know, Heyman himself was a, a refugee from Bosnia, but he's working on a whole book. Heyman's working on a whole book about uh, Bosnian refugees and his collecting of their life stories. And this particular life story is of a Bosnian refugee who lives a life that unfortunately for him is pretty much like the story of Candide, if you've read Voltaire's Candide, okay? You do not want this life to happen to you. It makes for great literature and a horrible existence. Um, but outside of that, almost everybody else is writing uh, essays uh, that are about themselves or about some kind of writerly take on the refugee experience. And I think this is really crucial because I think 
uh, one of the ways in which refugees become dehumanized and seen as other by people who are not refugees is that they're not seen as being people who are capable of something like speech, of something like creation, of something like telling us their own stories. And it was so absolutely important to have people who could tell their own stories. And in one of the reviews of this book by The Economist, it said, I like, I like quoting this myself, I'm not saying it about myself or, or, or the book, but The Economist says that this is the beginning of a refugee literary canon, okay? And there are, there, there are so many refugee writers out there, and I felt that this, 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 you know, this was crucial um, that we are announcing ourselves as not only refugees, but as writers. Uh, and both of those things, being a refugee and being a writer, uh, is really anathema to many Americans. That was a joke. Okay. Maybe it's I'm just bitter because I come from Los Angeles where no one cares if you're a writer. <laughs> <laughs> but so far as refugees are concerned, let me give you an example of how problematic the existence of refugees is, uh, are in this country. Uh, some of these Vietnamese refugees who came in 1975 ended up settling in Louisiana. And if you remember 30 years later, Hurricane Katrina happened and displaced tens of thousands of people in Louisiana. And some of the American media called these people refugees. And President George Bush said, it's un-American to call these people refugees. And for perhaps the only time in history, Jesse Jackson agreed with him. <laughs> a lot of these displaced people were African Americans, and Jesse Jackson said, it's racist to call African Americans refugees. I thought, that's great. We refugees have succeeded in bringing America together and hating us. <laughs> but I think there, there is something fundamentally un-American about the refugee because, uh, you know, Americans like to believe in the American dream. And that's why Americans like immigrants. Even Americans who don't like immigrants like the idea that immigrants want to come to this country because it proves we're awesome. But refugees are the unwanted where they come from and the unwanted where they come to. And they bring with them the reminder that maybe our own lives aren't as stable as we think they are because Americans like to think only failed states can produce refugees and we are not and can never be a failed state except for Puerto Rico, okay? So we might be a little bit closer than we think we are. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the situation in which I think like those high school students I was talking to, that people are discouraged from acknowledging themselves as refugees, even if in fact they are refugees. And um, I, I wanna turn the conversation back to our writers here and uh, just talk about you know, both being refugees and, and, and being writers. Um, maybe we'll start off with being writers because you know, I don't know if, I, if you wanna be just forever pinned as being, as being refugees, but uh, was it hard, given your backgrounds and your parents' backgrounds, war, refugees, and everything like that, was it hard to think about becoming a writer, much less becoming a writer, which I know is already hard? No, like, like lots of immigrants and refugees, mom and dad said that we needed doctors and lawyers. Lawyers heal what is broken in the human body. Every single adult body I know is broken. You know, once the shirts come off, once they wear shorts, like you see, I can feel shrapnel embedded in skin, in muscle, in, in bones. Um, and so my older sister, Dawa, won the Northland Elementary School spelling bee a year and a half after we came. Somehow, without speaking the language, she could take, a, take apart its, its pieces and piece it back together again. So we decided that she'd be an excellent, excellent lawyer, which loved me. And so shortly after we came, and this is important to the story of my journey as a writer, and certainly my journey as a public speaker, um, shortly after we came, my mom and I went to Kmart to, to look for light bulbs. And I knew the word light bulbs, but I didn't have the courage to say it out loud. And so I watched my mother, who was then only 25. I'm 37 today, to give you an idea. And I thought she was the most beautiful woman on earth. And because Laos had been the most heavily bombed nation in the world, remains the most heavily bombed nation, uh, my dad had told me stories about how my mom grew up in the most heavily bombed province of Laos. Every seven minutes, bombs, American bombs would fall. And my mother, instead of running with the old men and women, would walk. Her chin parallel to the ground, he said. And so I had this idea, this, this, this memory of my mother's courage. And they invited me in a refugee camp because she never had enough to eat. Because every time I looked at her, she'd give me what was in her hand, what was in her mouth. She had six miscarriages after me, all little boys who came too early to, to join us in life. 
you know, but that day my mother goes to the clerk and she says, I'm looking for the thing that makes the world shiny. She points to the ceiling. She has a thick accent. So the clerk listened for a bit and she started tapping her hand on the, on the counter. The faster the tapping, the harder it was for my mother. And once she struggled with the words, the clerk walked away. Mom and I stood there waiting, waiting for 15 minutes. And then I saw my mother bow her head. In the heart of a little child, I decide that if the world that we live in doesn't, hear to hear, doesn't need to hear my mother, then it surely doesn't need to hear me. At work, my father was a machinist, and every time he tried to ask a question or talk, his supervisor would say, B, you're here to talk to the machines. You're not here to talk to us. And so I started a revolution. The next day, I, started, I stopped talking in school entirely, and I became what was called a selective mute. Years and years later, I tried, but the rust in my throat had gone too deep. I'll never sound the way I, the way I sound in my ears in Hmong, in English. English, I'm just sculpting rocks into shape to make sense to a bigger world. I'm eternally breathless. I, I was born into a tonal language. Every breath that I breathe into the world carries meaning in my language. In English, I have to wrap the air in my lungs around units of meaning and then push it out. It's very hard thing. So I, I, I couldn't talk anymore, and, and I, I just stopped talking entirely. In all those years when I stopped talking, I was still writing. And every time I made a mistake on the page, because on the page, you don't have to meet people. You don't feel that, 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 that thumping on a counter. I became a stronger writer, because every time I made a mistake, there'd be a squiggly line and a question mark. What do you mean to say? You send a little girl chasing after meaning. You create a writer in the process. It'd be, it'd be incredible if I could sit here before you and said, oh, I became a writer because of my refugee family. But I became a writer because of the circumstances of the world that we were living in, white Minnesota. And so, and so at the end of college, I was still at Carleton College. I was still in American studies majors, women and genders, and, and, and I was cross-cultural studies because I thought all these things would make me a good doctor. I didn't understand that those are exactly the same things you need to become a good writer, to be interdisciplinary, to see things from multiple angles. But my grandma died the year I graduated, and she'd always said that education was the garden that I cultivated in America. One day we would reap the harvest. I knew that there would be no harvest uh, that we could reap together. And so I started writing as a love letter to my grandma. She was the reason why I wrote the love letters all the way to California when we lived in Minnesota. Long distance phone calls were very expensive. This is pre-cell phone days, you know? Um, and so I started writing a love letter, and the, that love letter grew. On page 37, my father said to me, Menai, what are you doing? And I said, I'm writing a love letter to my grandma. And my dad said to me, if you dream in the right direction, the dream never dies. You never wake up. It always only grows bigger. The idea was born. Wouldn't it be great if the world could love her with me, this illiterate woman who had so much to offer the world of knowledge as I would know it as I'd live it? And so a writer was born out of that process, that desperate process to be understood. Which is great because now when I speak, particularly in communities that don't know my work, um, there's a lot of disrespect at times. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter to me so much because I'm not looking for your agreement or disagreement. I stopped looking a long time ago. I'm looking to deepen your understanding of my humanity and perhaps in the process, your own. A long time ago, my daddy said to me, you know, do you know who, people would say, who are you writing for, thinking that I was writing for this tiny little audience, and, and I would defy that, I would fight that every way I knew. And my, one day my father said, you know the person I gave birth to, her work will go beyond her gender, it will go beyond her people, it is for a bigger humanity. You are no less than that. You know, all of these forces converged in the heart of me, they live inside of me, and they drive the stories out of me, even in a, in a language that I struggle to be understood in. I, you know, so when, when I got to the States, um, I, I think I told you I, I met my father for the first time. And um, it was only recently that I started remembering that for a long time um, he it wasn't so much that he felt like a stranger to me, but I felt like a stranger to him. I felt like an intruder in on his life. Um, and I, I, for a long time, I didn't realize that. I didn't, um, 
uh, I didn't make meaning out of that. Um, and of course, the idea of intruding, I, I've always kind of felt like I was intruding. Uh, even in my hometown where I grew up, I always felt like I was an intruder upon uh, someone else's territory. And, um, and then I, re you know, I started writing when I was in first grade, and, and I, I think back now, and I, I think part of what drove me and part of what delighted me about writing was that um, I, I think with, with art, it's good to be an intruder. You know, it's good to, to, you know, an intruder stakes out territory that is not theirs in some way. Um, uh, it, they break new ground or they try to. Um, they go into spaces uh, where they're uncomfortable because that's where the truth is. And so, and uh, by the way, I wasn't as a first grader thinking these things. Uh, I'm only now. Uh, I was kind of smart, but I wasn't that smart. Uh, but I, I think about that now, and, um, and, and I think that really appealed to me. And my parents really had no choice in the matter. You know, they knew that this is what I wanted to do. They were uncomfortable with it, as, as all practical immigrant uh, and overly protective parents are. Um, they just knew that they, that I'd at least chosen a very respectable profession. You know, in Vietnamese, the, the phrase is nha van. It's a very kind of elegant, very, you know, uh, it probably speak to their superior attitude about things. Um, and they liked that at least, but they always were a little bit suspect of it. You know, take a, an accounting class, you know, in college. They Take a business class. I took an accounting class and a business class just to please them. I think when the, the moment that they started, I think, to really um, respect what I was doing was when I started calling them and asking them stuff. When I started writing about Vietnam after I came home, I came back to Vietnam in 98 for the first time since leaving. And after that, I really directly started writing about Vietnam and my, um, and Vietnamese characters. And so I would ask them questions for research, especially my mom. My mom's a great storyteller. Actually, I wouldn't usually ask her because my dad is a terrible storyteller, so I would just avoid him altogether. But, but I think they, they really, um, they really, started appreciating what I was doing, mostly because they saw that I was re-engaging with where I came from. For me, what I realized is that I was finally kind of educating myself about myself. So if what I, you know, what I was going through growing up was a kind of you know, unintentional self-erasure, I was now kind of filling in the blanks uh, by, by just asking these questions. And I think my parents, um, really appreciate that. And I think, <laughs> actually I think the proof that they, that, that they really like what I'm doing now is, uh, this might be too much information, but four years ago, um, my mom, they, they, they were, my parents were having marriage, uh, marriage issues, and my mom was very upset, and she called me up, which is something my mom never does with any of my siblings and I which is to confide in us about things like this. She was calling me up and she was telling me all this stuff that I kind of didn't want to know, you know? And, and she then was asking for my advice. And, and this is what she said. She said, well, your dad said you're a writer, so you, you could probably help her, <laughs> me. Uh, and I think that's evidence that, that I got to the promised land with them. I do have more questions for you guys, but I actually want to make sure that we have time for questions from the audience, too. So is there, is there a microphone for people, or do they stand up? And, okay. So there will be a microphone. Uh, so you just need to raise your hands, and uh, we'll get a microphone out to you. I guess it was last month I had the opportunity to um, hear another Vietnamese writer who's written a graphic novel, The Best We Can Do. Um, and you are aware of her, obviously, right? Okay, <laughs> anyhow, um, she said that one of the difficulties that she, not, she herself did not encounter because her family was forthcoming in telling stories, but that in the audience and in other encounters, she's found that there's a real difficulty in 
the older generation being willing to talk at all so that these stories can even be told. Uh, and I was wondering whether you've had experiences with others uh, in the, having that same issue. And, and so there was a lot of discussion about, well, how do you go about getting them to talk? Uh, but the, 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 the author, by the way, is T. Bui, T-H-I-B-U-I. I blurbed the book. It's a fantastic book. It's, it was shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Award. And if you get the paperback, it's a comic book memoir. And if you get the paperback, there's a special comic book interview between me and her where, of all things, we discuss how I do my hair. Go figure. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can tell it's really important to me. I'm a very shallow person. Uh, did you want to? You want? Oh, yeah, and she's in here. She has a comic book. I'm sorry. Yeah, she also has a comic book essay in this, uh, in this book. She's Maybe fantastic. Wanna, she's fantastic, yeah. You guys want to answer the, the question? So I was born in this camp, right? And I, had, um, I couldn't go to school, and so all the adults would tell me stories. I think it's a factor of where I was born, this gap generation. They wanted to tell me that there was a world beyond, and so I was housed, bathed, showered in stories, stories that I didn't necessarily think were my history. I didn't understand that, it, that these stories were my history. I didn't understand that these stories would be the stuff of which I would build a future. But I, all of my life, all the adults in my life, have always been very forthcoming with their stories and their pain. I have heard that question many times from different audiences. Right now, I'm working on a book of Somewhere in the Unknown World out in the fall of 2019. And it is a book about refugee stories. So I've been talking to lots of refugees. I think the challenge is actually having the language and the ability to listen. When you ask a question, you have to be willing to sit there through the answer. For example, I asked a Karen boy, I said, you know, because he keeps he, he sniffs glue, and so I said, "Why do you sniff glue?" And he looked at me, and he said, "You know, you know when I think about dying." And I said, "When?" And he said, "I don't think about dying when I'm sniffing glue, with my friends. I think about dying when I'm right here in this sunny classroom. You know, all of those years when the world didn't know about me, I had a cell phone and I knew it. And here in this sunny classroom, where I'm supposed to learn about a bigger life, a bigger world, no one is interested in learning about me." not heard a, a word about my people. This is here and now, these moments like this, that I wanna die. I think that's the hard part. If you're gonna ask the hard questions, you have to be willing and able to sit through the hard emotions, the hard truths, you know, and, and that's hard. That's challenging for a lot of people. It takes a certain kind of personality, a certain kind of, um, a level of patience, and a level of emotional fortitude to be able to to just sit through and to carry those stories forward with, with integrity. But, but nobody um, has said no, I'm not interested in talking about the past. Just, just two days ago, an old Eritrean man told me, I wish I had a camera. If I had a camera, I could, sh I could show you the 27 beautiful young people hanging on the streets, you know, to show us fear. But we, I didn't have a camera. All I had was my heart and my head. And he wept, and they're in here still. And maybe if you write this down, maybe that my heart and my head will be lighter. I think the people that we come from are dying to be understood. Without language on their side, they've not had the tools to do the storytelling. And I think that's, you know, that's true of a lot of the immigrants and refugees I mean, that I'm talking to, particularly refugees living in PTSD. And so I've not yet met one who said no. The thing is, are you really willing to listen? Can I, how much time do I have? How many young people have two, three hours to listen to an elder talk? Well, that becomes the question. That with, with the parents' generation, um, that seems to be where the, uh, where they shut down so much. They're not mm -hmm. willing to share with <coughs> them. Well, let me, let me just amend that by saying, it's, 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 yes, it's sometimes true that your individual parents will not always tell you what you want to hear. But collectively speaking, Vietnamese people don't shut up. Um, that's, that was my experience growing up. I mean, really, no, you, I, I would go to Vietnamese community events, for example, when I was a kid, and all the elders would get up and say their thing. You know, Maybe not every elder would get up, but enough of them, and our place as a younger generation was to sit and listen, um, which is, you know, that's, a, that's an art, but it's also an act of endurance. Um, <laughs> And you know we're waiting for our time to, 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 to get up and, and speak. And that's a very mixed experience because, yes, the older generation has had the opportunity to speak with, within its own language, within its own community, but they feel distinctly the pain of not being heard outside of that in English. And they see the younger generation 
being fluent in English, and, and I think they, they regard that with mixed feelings because yes, stories are being told in English, but it, our stories may not be their stories. Our stories are our versions of history, and they may not agree. I was literally gonna say the exact same thing. I can't get my mom to shut up you know, about it. Um, uh, but no, it wasn't just that first part. Um, I mean, I think it depends on, it depends on you know, the person and it depends on the trauma. I think obviously certain people don't want to, you know, to speak too often about certain experiences. But for the most part, I, I, that was never an issue for, for my family, for my parents or, or my, uh, my aunts, uncles. They, they're constantly, you know, I, I get the, the request that I think a lot of writers get from their elders, which is, let me tell you my story so you can write it down and, and make a book out of it. Um, and, uh, you know, at least with my mom, uh, her request, and she literally did say that many times over the years, but I, I think her idea of it was to write down what I've suffered, write down, um, write down my trauma, and write down the facts of it, right? And the thing that I would tell her, but that I didn't, is that, you know, um, if you don't want me to write your story, because if I did, I wouldn't stick to the facts. Because, you know, there's facts and then there's truth, and I feel like uh, the truth is something altogether different and is, in many ways, oftentimes the realm of fiction, you know? Um, and, and, you know, and trauma is not always, um, can't always be seen in a direct way, you know? For example, I think my mother calling me and telling me about her marriage problems with my dad is so much about the refugee experience. You know, the kind of distance that is forced upon uh, relationships, uh, the kind of lack of communication, and then when you're reunited, not knowing how to communicate again, even for decades, um, her marriage problem is much says so much more about her refugee experience than our, our experience on the boat in some ways. Uh, and, and that's what I would tell her, but of course she would force all the facts on me and want me to write it a certain way, you know. Uh, the gentleman with the baseball cap in the back had his hand raised for a while. Hi, uh, thank you to the entire panel for being here. So my question is around cultural values. Um, when you were growing up, um, I'm, I'm just curious if there were any things that stood out, um, good or bad, as being particularly poignant or memorable about American culture versus your family's culture, anything that may have um, really left an impression on you or perhaps given you a, a perspective that was different from your peers that may have given you an advantage. So there, I had a question at this point named Mark. Mark was very nice, he opened the doors for a lot of girls, but I was one of them. We were in third grade and one day Mark said to me, how many people are in your family? And so I answered it the way I've been taught. I said, right now, 74. <laughs> and Mark looked at me and Mark said, oh, I feel so bad for you. And I said, what do you mean? How many are in yours? And he said, four. And he said, I feel so bad for you. And I said, why? He goes, you're gonna have to go to so many funerals. You know, and, and I'm like, yeah, this is true. But one of the things that happened in my family was, you know, my grandma was old and she'd sit there by the window, always checking out the weather, um, making, my grandma loved to make ropes. She cut grocery bags and then twirled them on her legs and make ropes out of them. And I see my mom sitting in the corner in a little 900 square feet home, nursing the baby, and the younger ones are crawling and playing on the floors. In my life, I've always seen the whole spectrum of life. I've always understood that we are only in a moment for a space and time which was so different from a lot of my peers. Because in the classrooms, they talk about how grandma's dishes are always dirty. Like, you don't want to eat off grandma's plates because she, you know, she doesn't clean them well. Or how long it takes grandpa to get to the car, how annoying that is. And I always thought, how little empathy. I always thought, how one day, that will be you. When your hands have washed so many dishes, after your legs have walked so many miles, that will be you. But I, I think that the Hmong, the Hmong home, especially a home cloaked in poverty, is, is a life lived in close proximity. And so there are, you know, we share a lot of each other's space and time 
you know, like I grew up cutting my grandma's toenails and that was, she had a lot of grandkids to choose from, so I felt real special. Um, <laughs> I married a white guy and um, his father says uh, he would rather die than have him cut his toenails. Like he would rather pay somebody else, you know, when the time comes uh, to take care of them in those ways. They cannot, you know, Aaron can't wash his daddy's back. That wouldn't be a moment of love. It'd be traumatic for both of them. You know, <laughs> these things are real. These cultural things that you talk at, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, well, you used the word advantage, and I, I used to think I was very disadvantaged. You know, I, I grew up, um, I, I mean, I had a very, relatively very happy childhood, but I, I would always be very conscious of things, of, of feeling different and, and wanting to, to be a certain way and, and uh, not being able to or my parents not allowing me to and kind of blaming that on the fact that I was, you know, uh, an immigrant. And, um, and then I, I, I realized, it wasn't until my 20s, you know, when I was writing, I realized actually that was a, a great advantage for me because it, it made me, you know, when you're on the inside of things, you're not really paying as much attention. You're not looking around at things with the same critical eye that a person on the outside, looking inside and wanting to get inside. Uh, that person, the outsider, is looking in with a much more, uh, uh, you know, a much needier but also critical point of view. And that is the perfect space for a writer, for, for an artist. So it became an advantage for me, not just as a writer, but I think as a person. You know, it, I, I think I'm pretty socially fluid, and I think that comes from being, from growing up the way I did. You know, um, I'd like to think that I'm empathetic, you know, but I also think that comes from, from growing up on, you know, feeling on the outside of things, which by the way, Everyone feels on the outside in some way, you know, so th that's what unites us and when you realize that you 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 know have a much more you have a richer point of view Well, my, my parents wanted two things for me when uh, when I was growing up One was that I get a good education and the other was that I become a good Catholic They got one out of two okay. and uh, they were very devout Catholics, you know, they went to church um, every week, and now that they're retired, they go to church every day. Um, that's their idea of entertainment. And I grew up- Mine too. Yeah. Every day. No, no. So here's, here's my point, here's my point. You know, Catholics in general like to suffer, but Vietnamese Catholics love to suffer, okay? Uh, and I grew up, you know, our, our masses are longer, for example, and I grew up just uh, with this sense that we were born to suffer. And I would watch my parents work 12 to 14 hour days and then they would come home and then they would have to cook dinner and dinner was boiled meat, okay? Now, for example, now tongue, beef tongue is apparently a fashionable dish. Who knew? We were doing that 30 years ago. <laughs> but now you get beef tongue done all kinds of nice ways. Back then, my, my parents just boiled the whole piece of tongue and cut it up and they didn't shave the bristles off and the condiment was watered down fish sauce. That was it, that was dinner. Okay, so that's, just, that's an example. I, my, I, I, was having, I was watching Leave it to Beaver, okay? And I was like, oh my God, what the hell is a pot, a pot roast? What is meatloaf? It looks so cool. And so that was, a, that was a, that, I'm not joking. This was like, this, this, was, this was, I think, um, the basis uh, uh, for me to become a writer was the idea that, uh, first of all, you know, I could endure suffering. And that's really basically what a writer is, uh, more than anything else. Um, so I really learned from my parents' example. Uh, they didn't want me to work in a grocery store, but they wanted me to suffer, I guess. So they got, they got something. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. So there's one in the front and one, in, one, one there and one in the back. Yeah. So my question is, or I, I guess I just want you to each talk about this. Your unique bridges for each of you between what came before you and the experience you had coming here, and what's gonna happen next. And you mentioned earlier that your son is gonna grow up to be a middle class American. Is that a loss? I mean, in some ways, will there ever be another you? Your children will not be you. They oh, will God. not have, well, 
they won't have that same sensibility. So I, I guess what I'd like to know is if you think that's a wonderful thing or if that's a loss. I mean, it's both. Uh, yeah. Look, what I want, okay, to be the person that I am, I had to go through all that, all the stuff that I just told you about, right? Would I want my son to grow up like that? Absolutely not. Uh, because then I'd have to live like that too. Um, but I'll give you an example, a legal example, okay? So uh, Star Wars comes out, the newest Star Wars comes out, and there's a Vietnamese American actress in it, Kelly Marie Tran, playing Rose Tycho. I was so excited. I was so excited. You know, in the 1970s and 1980s, I would have been blown away by the idea of a Vietnamese or an Asian American in Star Wars, and here it is, we made it, okay? So, I, and my son is a fan of Star Wars, he's a fan of Legos, and so I told him, hey, I took him to the Lego store, I'm gonna buy him Legos, okay? I take him to the Lego store, and I show him the box with Kelly Murray Tran's Rose Tycho figure, and I, and I said, do you know who this is? He said, no. I said, this is Rose Tycho, played by Kelly Murray Tran, and she's Vietnamese, and he said, I don't care. <laughs> I said, I'm gonna make you care. So I told him, I'm gonna buy this Lego set and I'm gonna give it to your best friend. He said, no, don't do that. You know? Yeah. So, but now when I ask him, who is this? He said, it's Rose Tycho. And he said, who is she? And he'll say, she's Vietnamese. I'm Vietnamese. So I understand, I understand your question, you know, that, that I now as a parent feel the loss and I want my son, I'm going to inflict on my son some of the th same things that were inflicted on me, but with a difference. Like my parents made me go to Vietnamese Sunday school, language Sunday school. I hated every minute of it. He's gonna to go to Vietnamese school, but with a difference, I made my own Vietnamese school. I found all the local cool Vietnamese parents who are liberals and progressives working in the film industry and entertainment, and we have our own Vietnamese language program. Okay, so that's what I mean. Like, so, so there's a recognition that, that yes, we want, to, we want to retain some of these things, but I don't want to do it the same way my parents did. You know, so we're going to do it our way instead, and that's the way to sort of mediate loss and you know, acknowledge that the future is coming. But I also think, like, you know, like, I don't think there's ever been a culture or a history of a people that, let me put it this way, no culture, no... Uh, history of a people has ever had a period that it was its most most itself. It's been always, you know, every culture is, uh, uh, evolves and, and changes. And I, so it's inevitable and, and I, I'm not going to get in the way of that, especially if there's progress, you know. Um, you know, the key though, of course, is to do two things, is to is to uh, embrace the future and the future versions of me and, and, and hopefully my child and, and my, uh, my community, but also remember uh, the older versions of us, you know, and try to do that simultaneously as, as well as we can. I'm gonna to try to answer your question with three short stories. So I went to graduate school on the Paul and Daisy Strolls Fellowship for New Americans. They're one of the biggest fellowships for graduate studies in the land. But at this big finalist dinner, um, the first question at the table was Kao Kalia Yang. Is it true that wars bring on good things so that you are one of those examples? If not for this war in Laos, wouldn't you be in the high mountains of Laos with a baby on your back and a gardening hole in your hand? And I, my uncle, who, who trained me for this final set, you have to yell. You have a soft voice, you have to yell. Sitting at this long table with kids from Harvard and Stanford predominantly, uh, doctors and lawyers predominantly, and so I was like a creative nonfiction writer from a small liberal arts college in the Midwest, this Hmong person, and I yelled out, no. I said, I don't want your money if that's how you feel. I said, who's to say that the two people who I died, who died so I could be here, that one of them wouldn't have, wouldn't become, have become a better writer, or that together the three of us couldn't have created a better story. If that's how you feel, take me longer, but I don't want your money. The second story. So um, yes, we are bridges from the past, but we're also bridges to the future. I have a four and a half and an identical twin boys who are two and a half, and they're interracial. And so when people look at them, Hmong is not immediately apparent. You know, they'll say, oh, maybe Latino, they'll, they'll guess. Um, but my daughter, who has gray green eyes, you know, she looks at me and she says, I'm Hmong. And I can see already in her face, every time she says I'm home, a different kind of fight ensuing. I will never be able to inhabit her reality or those of my boys, you know, who are identical twin boys. And so they have their, their own particular battles. 
When I first became a writer, one of the first book groups that invited me was my teachers, my English teacher. I wrote about her. I was going to email her and tell her that I used her real name, but then she invited me to her book group. And so I went and they read my book and they said, are you worried that the Hmong children right now are no longer speaking Hmong? Are you worried that you're losing yourself? And my little sister, who was then only 14, had gone with me because I didn't know what was going to happen in somebody's, some white people's house. You know, it doesn't happen often. <laughs> I never got you know, that kind of invitation before. And so she made a little bit of a squeak and everybody looked at her and she said, I have an answer for that. And, and I looked at her and she said, you know, I'm the Hmong from America. Galia was the Hmong born in Laos. Mom and dad were born in, China, uh, in, in Laos. Uh, Galia was born in Thailand. Mom and dad were born in Laos. And then my great grandparents are from China. And now there's Hmong in French Guiana, Hmong in Germany, Hmong in Canada, Hmong all over the world. Who's to say who's more or less Hmong? I have a face that fits in all of Asia. People tell me I'm Korean. They tell me I'm Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese all the time. You know, when I look into the mirror, it is the Hmong heart of me that feels there's no map in the world with a land on it that, that is mine. But there's a Hmong mountain in my heart that I climb every single time I get on the page, that I inhabit every time I speak. I stand on top of that mountain to speak to you right now. That beating Hmong heart will build the unimaginable, the impossible. My people do not know how to imagine that we needed doctors and lawyers, when we, that, that we needed writers when we came here. We were aiming for doctors and lawyers. I am a possibility in the impossible. When the biggest military force in the world went to the high mountains of Laos, commissioned 32,000 Hmong men and boys to fight and to die for the American cause, they never thought that there would be a writer like me emerging on American soil, planting boots in this country. That is the, that is the miracle of the future. And so I'm not going to sit up here, I think none of us are, and say that we are the worried about the losses for our children. We don't understand yet what, what they're capable of. Parents, like teachers, don't set limits for your children. We push for their highest possibilities, as my mother and father did for me, and as my, my colleagues here, their parents have done for them. I think that is the incredible thing. I, there is very little in dwelling in the landscape of love, loss, when you want to plant lives full of love. Does that make sense? We'll take one last short question, um, and, and then uh, we'll try to keep our answers short so we can get to the book signing. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your words today. Um, I guess my question is, have you ever thought about your process of storytelling as also a process of translation? Because I know that you were talking about how expressing yourself, for instance, in the Hmong language versus in English is like this punching out from your chest. Um, and I was wondering whether you, all of you, thought of things that were untranslatable or on the flip side, something new that comes out of using English rather than Vietnamese or Hmong? Just like an easy yes or no. Uh, oh, easy yes or no? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Do, the answer is yes here. Yeah, it yes. is entirely. It's entirely what? A, a work of translation. Oh, sorry. No, no, this is good. I yelled. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I. I didn't catch the entire question, but I, I, in terms of translation, I, I've, um, I had this wonderful experience in my novel. There is um, a, a lullaby uh, that it's like four lines, and I put it in the book, and I took it from some website. And during the process of getting permissions uh, before the book comes out, I decided I'd, it was too hard to find out who I would get permission to use this translation, so I decided to translate it myself. And I had this wonderful experience of calling my mom and, and my dad, and like talking to my dad, and he, he'd translate a you know, line this way, and then and I talking to my mom, and then my dad is emailing me and saying, your mom's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I end up kind of taking both of their translations, but then I had this wonderful moment where you know, uh, there's this sound that Vietnamese people make, Oi. and, I, and I, I just found the perfect word for, to kind of express that. And it was just, uh, I don't know, it was a, a great six hours for me that day, because I, I, I remember in my mind, I said, oh, I feel a little bit more Vietnamese today, <laughs> you know? I, I can't remember, did you use the word Oi in your novel? Okay, no. oi, oi is a very intimate word. Oi, oi will bring tears to your eyes if you're Vietnamese. And so there's no translation. You can say it's like, you know, uh, it's like if, if I were to speak to my girlfriend or my wife, I would say, em oi. And she would say, an oi, you know. 
uh, so there's no translation. Um, it's a hailing. Uh, and I remember, to your question of translation, it's a very tricky question, um, because there are things that, are, can, that cannot be translated, even if you can translate them. And I'll give you an example. I was just like in a, you know, a drugstore, and uh, next, standing next to a guy who was Vietnamese, and he didn't know that I was Vietnamese because like, like Kalia, people oftentimes will not know that I'm Vietnamese by looking at me, and he was speaking Vietnamese on his cell phone, clearly to his child, because he said, uh, that means literally, uh, uh, child, could be daughter, daughter or son, this dad, have you eaten yet? Okay, that's a little translation, okay? But it's untranslatable, it made me cry. You know what I mean? Because uh, when you use terms like ba, dad, gone, child, it's a relational system. And you hear it, you, you grew up with this, you know? So my son has not grown up with this. He calls me, he calls me daddy. I don't know, maybe if you were an English-speaking refugee in another country and you heard the word daddy, you would cry. Uh, you're Vietnamese-speaking and you hear ba, gone, and you say, you know, an gum chua, an gum chua is, not just have you eaten yet, it's the gesture of hospitality. Whenever anyone comes to your house, you ask this question. So all that is brought up in hearing these, these words. And this guy, you know, he did not look like a sensitive person, okay? <laughs> My stereotype, mechanic or something. But here he was inqu inquiring uh, as to his child, this loving gesture, untranslatable in another language. Now, that being said, when I wrote The Sympathizer, I, I knew that uh, for those of us who are, are you know, so-called minority writers, the, what's expected of us is, in this context, speaking to a, a majority audience, which is you know, you know, the, the publishing industry, we're normally expected to translate, either literally, you know, translate this word, or implicitly, translate the culture that you're representing to all these people who know nothing about your culture. And that is a very debilitating thing, to accede to that. Because, for example, if I'm writing a story about something Vietnamese and I mention pho, and what if I said pho, comma, a delicious beef noodle soup, comma, <laughs> clearly I'm translating, and clearly I'm assuming you don't know what pho is, but Jonathan Franzen would never say sandwich, comma, two slices of bread with some delicious stuff in between. He assumes that he does not have to translate the fucking sandwich, okay? <laughs> we have to translate pho, so in The Sympathizer, it's, it's deliberately written to refuse translation. It's a very important uh, decision that I made. So it's a confession from one Vietnamese person to another Vietnamese person. And, and if that's the case, you don't translate pho, right? The whole translation process is in reverse because one Vietnamese person has been to the United States, the other Vietnamese person hasn't. So it's actually American culture that's being translated back. So yes, the, the, the pressures for translation are tremendous when it comes to minority writers. And we have to be, as my, those of us who identify as minority writers of whatever kind, we have to be very aware of that. And we have to be very smart about trying to figure out when and when not to translate. I would like to thank um, the American Writers Museum for hosting us. I would like to thank um, Vu and Kalia for being here. I would like to thank all of you for coming out here in this evening.